And now we come to the next panel, chaired by Jagan Shah and Andy Oldman. All the audience as well as the participants around the table, welcome uh, to this uh, discussion, which will be led by two presentations. Um, I just wanted to very quickly run through uh, what are possibly the key questions or the key words really that we'll be uh, dwelling upon in this session. Um, decentralization and decentralization as a larger phenomenon, not only of governance, but of the urban phenomenon itself, um, will be one of the key words. Uh, devolution of powers uh, from possibly central to state to local governments and uh, the level to which that dev devolution is desirable, possible, and our capacity to actually deliver that kind of uh, devolution of powers. Um, autonomy is, is another very important and tantalizing word, um, very difficult to achieve, but nevertheless uh, are desirable uh, overall. Um, the metropolitan phenomenon itself, and our first speaker will dwell upon uh, on this in greater detail. Um, and overall, I think, to understand the issue of um, uh, urban governance and urbanizing government um, and devolving the state in a historical as well as a theoretical perspective. Um, and uh, without going any further on the key themes, I, I just wanted to uh, maybe establish a little line of continuity from earlier uh, speakers in the earlier session where um, uh, Mr. Richard Sennett uh, spoke about governments, so the multiplicity of governments and that uh, being a very important fact and, and, and not something that one can uh, shy away from quite easily. And uh, Ed Glazer's flagging of, uh, of one issue that he considers important, which is cities need government, uh, possibly they need more government. Um, Lastly, I just wanted to uh, point out, and when Ricky uh, introduced the urban age to everyone and showed us the covers of these newspapers, something that really struck me was that this newspaper, unlike the earlier newspapers, has people on its cover uh, and people in close up. And perhaps this might be an important theme for us to explore in the context of Delhi where uh, we have a photograph of people opting in. They want to be part of a process and can we devolve power, can we decentralize government to the point where that participation, that opting in of uh, the, the key stakeholder in the urban uh, governance structure, uh, that opting in can actually find respect and find adequate response. Um, so with that, I'd like to invite our first speaker, uh, Dr. K.C. Sivaramakrishnan. Um, as Ricky said, we will not go into introductions. There are introductions in this insert in the newspaper. Um, we would like to hear the views and then discuss. Dr. Sivaram. Uh, thank you. At the outset, I must apologize for not getting up and speaking. If I try to do an Ed Glacier around this table, I'll take several tumbles. So I'm staying put for this presentation. After 50 years of involvement in urban matters and urban governance, I carry a burden of memories and a burden of thoughts. And uh, from that point of view, my presentation will be somewhat historical on issues of governance, where I try to emphasize that a political view is needed. And without a political vision, it is not likely to move forward. And this is something which has evaded us. Uh, I think we have to accept the fact that for long urban local government has been regarded in this country as a lesser government. It was so during the colonials and it is particularly so after independence. In comparison, rural local governance is better regarded partly because of our long-standing romance in over the rural. And if you look at the parliamentary representation my friend who is sitting next to me in Action Lake is perhaps one of the few people who is from urban constituencies. Out of 542 Lok Sabha seats, 92 are prima facie urban. And if you look at the state assemblies, 25% of the total seats may be urban. It does not reflect the reality. And so one of the first things we have to understand is that urban constituencies in this country continue to be underrepresented. 
And therefore, when we talk of a voice for urban India, that voice is still muted, scattered, disorganized, and does not have consistent political backing. The, the 74th Amendment, which has been talked about, and I was one of the people who was involved in drafting that amendment, and after 10 years of experience, I must concede that it has not helped bring about the desired change. In many urban areas, there are numerous non-municipal territorial entities, parastatals, gated communities, which occupy functional and financial domain. And I do feel that the very elaborate reservation system we have for SEs and STs, though it is taken from the parliament and state patterns and OBCs, have fragmented the representative base for urban constituencies and has not permitted continuities. The mayors in India continue to be ceremonial. And in a place like Bangalore, which prides itself as a knowledge city, the mayor is a one-year wonder. And before he or she understands the boundaries of her cities, it is time for her to take farewell parties. And you also find that the tenure varies across the country between one year, one and a half years, two and a half years, and five years. And the arrangement with regard to the election of the mayors, in some states they have experimented with the directly elected mayors, but the pattern is changing. They prefer indirectly elected mayors. One of the people here in this audience is Tikam Singh Panwar from Simla. He belongs to the vanishing breed where the directly elected mayors are being abolished. So I think Benjamin Barber has now to write a new book. It's not a question of what if mayors rule the world? What if nobody rules the cities? Who is really in charge of a city? In India, I find it's a perpetual question. And it depends on the way, it depends on the day of the week. The 74th Constitutional Amendment is based on the fundamental principle that all urban areas should have a municipal governance set up. But this has not happened. The government itself has derailed the provisions of the Constitutional Amendment by inserting a loophole whereby state governments are allowed not to set up municipal bodies. In other words, even that basic premise that municipalization is an organizing principle has been given the go by. We also have to recognize whether we like it or not. All of us are professionals and researchers and scholars, and we have a certain affinity. But this is not reflected as far as the populace is concerned. The demand side for self-governance is not as strong as we expected. Three months ago, in Tata Nagar Jamshedpur, where the Tata Iron and Steel have been fighting for 100 years the municipalization of that city. The case has been going on in the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court about two months ago said, what is it that the people would like? Why don't you find out? And the people gathered and they said, we would love to be looked after by Tata Steel. We do not want municipalization. We do not want to pay taxes. We would love to be looked after. And so in other words, therefore we are facing a particular problem. The demand side of the society, do we really want municipalization? Are we prepared to stand for our political representative? Are we I think this requires a significant change of mind as far as the political spectrum is concerned. There is also this ambivalence and double talk. Some of us talk about Ahmedabad and Surat and Mumbai and Mysore and Chennai as examples. What do we really want? Do we want state government appointed officials to run the city? Do we want a politically accountable person to run the city? Because of strong executive powers vested in the commissioners appointed by the state government, is this what we want? Let us make up our mind. 
We cannot continue to be ambivalent endlessly. Madhya Pradesh and West Bengal have tried to bring together the political and the executive together by the mayor in council. But I think we need to be clear in our mind. We cannot continue to be ambivalent on this particular point. And at the same time, proclaim, you know, some kind of a democratic decentralization. Uh, <clears throat> I think uh, of late, uh, you are getting the smart cities. We have talked about it, okay? I'm not saying that it is the flavor of the month or flavor of the year. But it is essentially a public works approach to better delivery of services. But at the same time, some things are not smart. Maximizing private gain by monetizing urban land is not smart. Allowing indiscriminate proliferation of private transport and at the same time talking about increasing public mobility is not smart. Gated communities and at the same time talking about democratic pluralism is not smart. Bypassing of local governments is not smart. Smart cities are only a partial answer, but they are shortcuts. We need to see what kind of a governance system we want. Government now seems to be making a beginning in some of the national movements about the importance of public and political participation. But if participation is sought, there must be political accountability. If accountability is sought, there has to be political authority. You cannot have political accountability without political authority. And therefore we go back to one year wonders as mayors and mayors as ceremonial people. I would like to sum up the political situation, you know, as far as urban areas in this country is concerned, as fractured thinking. We are not really clear what we want. We feel what happens on the ground is a substitute. I would like to make a slight departure from the previous speakers that there can be a distinction between government and governance. I think they do go together. And I think when I talk about government, I'm not just talking about a structure as an answer to all the problems. I think it is very, very important that this fractured thinking, which has resulted in a fragmented set up is something that we need to seriously consider. I do regard this as a political failure. I regard this as a policy failure. And the fact that I, among several others, have been involved you know, in this particular process for several years in this country does not absolve me of any responsibility. I have to take my share of this responsibility and I feel that this is high time we make up our mind as far as the political system is concerned, as far as the cities are concerned, as far as the self-governance systems are concerned. We cannot talk about democracy and democratic pluralism. And I certainly agree with John Claus that the future really lies in this unanswered question. Do we want a democratic setup? And if we do want it, are we prepared to pursue that line? Or we always go back to somehow hold the powers and hold authority and talk about democratic pluralism only for purposes of political rhetoric. So I would end here, and I thank you for this opportunity. Um, Dr. Sir Ramakrishnan has raised a lot of questions and perhaps the next speaker is going to help us uh, answer those questions. Um, may I now invite uh, Professor Gerald Frug from uh, Harvard University to uh, speak about deciding who decides. So I'm very happy to be here. 
And I'm particularly happy to be on a panel with my friend KC, from whom I've learned a great deal about city governance. Uh, I'm very, very happy that he and I are in dialogue here. So many people, when they think about the problem of city governance, think it's this, that the city government needs to be more responsive to the people who live within it. And this is plainly a very important goal, but it leaves out something very important itself, which as the organization of city government is not in the hands of city officials and not in the hands of city residents. The organization of city government is in the hand of central government. In the United States and in India, the organization of city government is in the hands of states. And in much of the world, it's in the hand of nations. These central governments decide what cities can do and decide what cities cannot do. They organize the financial system so that they decide the revenue that cities can raise and the revenue that cities cannot raise. They decide what it is that cities can do and what it is that states will do themselves. And even more importantly, they create, as Casey was just saying, an endless number of public corporations, parastatals, uh, public authorities, and independent bodies organized along uh, functional lines. So, we have a system of fragmented government, fragmented hierarchically, national, state, local, and, a hard, uh, and fragmented uh, along function, special function. This fragmented system, this dysfunctional system is a design. It's a design by central government. The question is, what are we going to do about it? So the usual answer that I hear is that we should get local autonomy. I want to suggest to you that this is not an answer, that local autonomy is not possible, that every issue that faces urban uh, life, uh, land use, transportation, education, the environment, housing, poverty, you name it, every issue is a local issue a state issue, and a national issue. You cannot divide issues. In addition, every city is surrounded by many other cities. Every city that makes a decision, uh, makes a decision that impacts cities in their own neighborhood. You cannot allow a city to decide its own future. There are endless reasons for state and uh, national governments to control city life. It's not just fragmentation, and it's not just that somebody has to look out for the people who live in the neighborhood. It's also corruption. It's also incompetence. It's also the protection by elites, local elites of their own kind. We, we have to give up the idea that there can be local autonomy. And yet, and yet, local democracy is a vital form of human freedom. It's very important. It's essential as a part of human freedom for people in a community to have control over their own lives. In a city, it's possible for ordinary people to participate in decision making that they cannot participate at a higher level like state and local government. Besides, cities are very different from each other. And indeed, local participation is a way of ensuring that the, this difference uh, continues. And the problems I've identified with cities, like corruption, incompetence, and protection of elites, is not the property just of cities. States have those problems as well. Nations have those problems as well. There's a very good reason to decentralize power to cities, and that's why we do so. The problem of city governance is this, that both the arguments I just made that state and, and uh, central control of localities is essential, and the argument I just made that local uh, government is a vital form of human freedom, both those arguments are correct and they conflict with each other. The question is, what are we going to do about it? And I want to suggest to you that the, the focus should be 
on trying to figure out who is the designer of the system. At the present moment, the designer of the system, as I've suggested, is central government. And central government designs the system without the participation of cities, without any local participation. We need to redesign how decisions are made. This is not an argument for bottom up rather than top down. We have to stop talking about bottom up and top down as opposites of each other. Both are necessary. The people who talk about bottom up talk about the community and local participation, but they never talk about the top. The people who talk about the top disregard what happens at the local level. The issue is how do they relate to each other? What I want to suggest to you is that we need to figure out a way for cities to participate in the allocation of power. That it is the organization of decision making about who decides that cities should be part of the participation of. Now you might think that this idea, the idea that cities can collectively participate in the organization of city power is some academic idea made up by uh, some law professor. Uh, but actually, if you look at the history of democracy, the history of national and state democracy is the history of localities getting together and forming a central government. That state legislatures, national legislatures are elected locally. And the local representatives together are supposed to together be the central government. The idea that the collective localities are the central government is a fundamental idea in the history of, of democracy. The problem is at the moment it doesn't work that way. That in the United States, cities are not represented in the legislature. Cities are divided and they're combined. Legislators do not pay attention to local officials. They pay attention to political parties and political leadership. Governors do not pay attention to local officials. They make decisions paying attention to the state as a whole. Local officials have become lobbyists, very ineffective lobbyists. They're lobbyists for particular ideas. They want one more power. That is not enough. What they need to be is at the table when decisions are made about who makes the decisions about the allocation of power. The question is, how to do that. In the United States, which is where I focused, I think the answer to this question should be at the metropolitan level. It, we now recognize, many people now recognize that the, it's already been said at this conference that the city is expanded beyond the border, by which we mean there are as many cities within a metropolitan area. So the metropolitan area can be an idea for the organization of another form of government which is a form of government in which the cities collectively make decisions. The, the idea of metropolitanization should depend on who is the metropolitan government. The way I have proposed it in the United States is that the metropolitan government be made up of all cities, all cities collectively. Notice this is not an idea of autonomy. It's not the idea that any particular city can make a decision by their own. It's an idea that all the collective cities together, the neighbors of the deciding city and every other city will be part of the decision-making process. It's a protection against parochialism and self-dealing. On the other hand, a, a collection of cities should be able to control power. You may think, well, why would the state ever give this body such power? In the United States, almost every state uh, has metropolitan areas that make up a majority of the population. If a majority of the cities in the United States in any particular state got together and worked with each other rather than against each other, they could control the state. The idea is not to abandon the state, that is not possible, nor to limit the state. The idea is to change its nature. What I wanted, what I've come to India to discuss with you is the relevance of this idea, the idea of organizing ultimate decision-making, decision-making about the structure of government. I want to discuss with you 
the relevance of this idea to this country. That's what's important to me, to try to think about it. If you think that autonomy should be the way we decentralize government, then I would like you to tell me what item on the ag urban agenda you are willing to allow cities to decide immune from state and national control. I don't think that's the way to do. I think we have a strategy question. And the strategy question is this, what is the best way forward? And in my view, the best way forward is to, find, is to pinpoint where the decisions are being made about, about who, who decides, decides what. what. In, the in the United, United States, States, it's perfectly, perfectly clear, clear who that is. It's the state government. And the state government makes those decisions independent of the localities. We need to reorganize that. But I don't think this can be done in the United States uh, at the state level. That's why I propose a regional level. A regional level is the meaningful form of where we understand urbanization to go. And its multiplicity of cities should be a way forward. Thank you. Thank you, Gerald. Um, before we go to our panel, um, the two speakers, uh, um, there's a very, um, I'm sorry, with the multiple speakers, but something interesting to pick up from the two talks that we just had about the question of who decides. And uh, Casey, you said something very interesting. We have to decide what we want. We have to decide. And I think the question that you generally, who decides? Who decides? Who decides? And I'm struck that on the one hand, Casey, and you were a part of um, really the crafting of the legislation, the, the amendment um, that you talked about, the 74th Amendment, uh, which has failed. You said this has not been successful. So on the one hand, the attempt to legislate municipal governance and more uh, power to cities failed. And on the other hand, you also talked about weak demand, which is there's not an outcry for urban governance and strong urban governance and this contradiction. So on the one hand, we tried, you know, a central legislative approach. On the other hand, there's not an outcry from the grassroots for this. And similar in the United States from what you wrote, Joe, which is that the legislatures are dominated by non-urban interests, by suburban interests in many, in many cases. So I guess the question I have putting all this together to go back, Casey, listening to what Gerald said is, who decides? So when you say we must make up our minds, who is the we? Who is the we here that you think needs to come to this question of pinpointing, as Gerald put it, uh, where decisions are made and how these decisions should be made? How would that occur? What would happen differently, having seen, uh, tried so hard at the central government legislatively to do this, but not seeing an uprising to effectuate it at the local level? Where does that leave us? I think unlike other countries in India, we have not really come to terms yet with the phenomenon of urbanization. I mean, when that picture was shown about uh, Gandhiji saying that cities are an evil thing, for a long time, we accepted India living in rural, valley, rural as the only reality. It is only now that we are beginning to realize India also lives in its towns and cities. So one problem is the acceptance of urbanization. The second problem is the effects of urbanization which we are seeing visually are not necessarily encouraging. It is increasing inequality, it is increasing consumption patterns, and as John Close said, we are also becoming a part of a global, amorphous, meaningless, unidentifiable process of urbanization. In such a situation, it is taking the political spectrum and leadership as a whole who will have to come. They are the we as far as we are concerned because we have accepted a democratic system where principal decisions are given to representatives of the people, MPs, MLAs, and others. And I feel it is this spectrum. Very recently, the former mayor of Nagpur became the chief minister of Maharashtra. Will that indicate a different attitude, the problems of Mumbai and Pune and other cities? In Europe, 
today's mayor can become tomorrow's president. In India, with a lot of luck, today's mayor can at least hope to remain as a councillor. I'm afraid, I'm afraid this particular uh, mindset has to change. And when you ask that question, we, I would definitely put it as the political spectrum. And I think we need to know more about what is happening to this country. How much is the spread of urbanization? How it is increasing the income on the one hand? How it is increasing the opportunities? We still have a colossal uh, problem about migration. We somehow feel the imaginary gates of the city should be lowered. And if we can somehow prevent the people from coming into the city, we will be a much better place. I'm afraid we have highly simplistic notions about this, and we need to change that. You want to go ahead? No, go. OK. Um, I, th I think we'll, we'll move on to uh, uh, involving our, our discussions into this conversation. Um, I think it's important for us to also stay with what Gerald said, uh, which seems to be about mobilization as well. It's, it's, it's a lot about mobilizing these ground level voices, which are the voices of councillors or representatives. And this is the democratic process. And I think uh, we, we should stay with that and look at what the possibilities are. And may I invite uh, Mr. Charles Correa um, to, uh, to start the discussion? Well, um, I'm sorry I've lost my voice, so you'll have to hear this. Um, it seems to me that uh, we in India, <clears throat> we have democracy in our country, but not in our cities. Oh, thank you. Yeah, is it, is it on? Hello, yeah. Uh, it seems to me that in India, we have democracy in our city, in our country, but not in our cities. Our cities right now, as you know, are run by chief ministers and cabinets. They make all the crucial decisions, huge cru jumps, savage jumps in FSI, in land use, because they are not elected by the people of that city. They are elected by, from little towns. This is crucial change which has to be made. We have to have, you know, it comes from the British way of running India. There were four governors and they, the, the Bombay governor ran all the cities right up to Ahmedabad, Karachi, Quetta, right up to Aden. So, and he ran it through a bureaucracy. That's exactly what we are doing today. Now, this is not necessary. You don't have to have city-states, but you can have like in New York, you have New York City and you have New York State. And the, the decisions for New York City are made not by the governor, but by the mayor. And there's a confrontation. And that's what democracy is about. Confrontation resolved through negotiation. We have to accept that. I don't think you have to debate this academically. Each society finds its own balance. That is what others, we don't have democracy. You don't have to legislate for it, Shiva Ramakrishnan. It will work itself out. Like it's all our other things in our democracy, we have worked out for ourselves. I have faith that we can do this. Absolutely. Now, the, when, the one exception, as you know, sir, is Delhi, where you have a chief minister who is autonomous, I mean, with the cabinet. But if you look at Delhi, they, the, as far as I remember, I used to be urban arts commissioner here, the chief minister has no uh, say over the police, has no say over Lachans, Delhi. Huge part of Delhi. So how do you run a city state? How do you feel responsible for it when you don't have those powers? The last chief minister I'm talking about, Sheila Dixit Ji, she was, she was too, um, because she wasn't, I mean, she never raised this issue for political reasons. So she ended up, taking responsibility for many decisions which were not of her making. When Kejriwal became chief minister, he immediately brought up this issue. Who controls the police? There was a confrontation, 
But that's what we need. We need a confrontation with, between who runs Bombay and who runs Maharashtra. That is the strength of New York. That's the strength of these other places. Now, that's one point. I mean, let's put it aside. The second point, which I really must make about governance. My professor, Buckley Fuller, used to call the East India Company world pirates. And he said, world pirates act very decisively and very emphatically because they've got to survive. So they are proactive. Now, our governments faced with the biggest phenomena, which I think of the last several centuries, I think since man, nomadic man, became farmers, we've never seen such a huge change in human history of the, 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 the distress migration, which is all over the third world, including India, including China. No, there's nothing new in this. Europe went through this in the 17th, 18th, 19th century. Italians, Jews, Germans, English, they could, but they had a colonial system which allowed them to redistribute themselves around the world. That is not open to Indians today. Don't you realize that? So when someone shows up in Calcutta or Bombay or Pune, it is a substitute for a visa to Australia. What our responsibility is to increase the absorptive capacity of our system, urban system as a whole. That is it. Your be that is what we should be discussing, not trivial little bit. To me, at least, if you don't have a now a chance to get such an so there's a need for an overview of what is happening to Indian cities as a whole, and the chance for that came when Rajiv Gandhi set up the National Commission on Urbanization and in 85. And we had a chance to see the whole country and went all over the place. Now, the first thing that struck, it was a very positive report because the first thing that struck you was the incredible energy of Indian cities, not just the big ones, small ones, right across the nation. The best ideas come not out of Bombay or Delhi, They'll come out of Jalanda or Coimbatore and people doing wonderful workshop work, et cetera. So, uh, so our, our report was extremely positive and, and we set up several strategies. Now, what I'm trying to say is that we need to take this overview to realize why we need proactive. We cannot just sit back, which is what our government does, and wait for squatters to appear. We need to have an overview. I would think the National, your National Institute should be doing a monitoring. I was wonderful to see what Ricky presented today. I've never seen that kind of overview of our Indian cities, which are growing at what speed, why, what is the investment. We could identify in our way, we identified 325 cities, towns, Mundi towns, which were growing faster than the national average. And if you gave them just water supply or sewage, they would grow even faster. I'll give you an example. Erode in Tamil Nadu is one of them. I was there recently. It's the center, the biggest center in India for reprocessing fa fabric. You've got Germans, Swedes, all sorts of people. But it's got no sewage system. You've got people stepping over open drains. Now imagine if he's invested a, a sewage system there, water supply, instead of which that money goes to Delhi or to, to Bombay or to Chennai for some bauble. And that has to stop. We've got to realize that we are really uh, actually walking into a dead end. I'd like says to end, I know I'm through. I just want to end by saying we need that, that overview. And because I think for me, cities like the, like the coal fields of Bihar or the, or the Punjab wheat fields, they are part of our national wealth. They are, first of all, they, are, they generate the skills which you need for development. Secondly, they are engines of economic growth. Lastly, they are places of hope. That's what European cities were. Places of hope. 
It's the one chance for millions to have a better future. Let's remember that, and that is our strength. What we need is this proactive governance. It's not just accountability. It's also, let's, let's, let's hope your urban age can move into proactive governance. Thank you. Um, Hilmar, if you could jump in with um, the German Association of Cities. Well, first of all, I jump in cherishing an architect who is uh, so politically interested, I wished every German architect, or at least some of them, would be. Uh, very impressive. Well, we could lean back uh, from the side of the German cities and from the side of the German Association of Cities as we have the, constitu uh, the Constitution as our basis of acting. Uh, we have a uh, Section 28 in the German Constitution which says self-governance is guaranteed. But we cannot lean back as we have three dimensions to work on. It is the political dimension, it is the financial dimension, and it's the dimension of the people, uh, the inhabitants of the cities. So, a uh, brief view on the political dimension. We have uh, a long history to look at. Uh, it is now 207 years that we have the principle of self-governance uh, evolving from the Declaration of Riga, where those who were defeated by Napoleon in the Prussian Empire had laid down these principles of self-governance which were disrupted between 1933 and 45, but were a constant um, basis of um, self-governance in German cities uh, under whatever reign it was, whether it was the Prussian kings, the Kaiser, uh, the Weimar democracy, or the democracy after the Second World War. So, the timeline is an important thing, and uh, one could say now it depends on time. On the other side, we know how fast decentralization can come over regions and local um, uh, bodies. Take the example of Indonesia, where all of a sudden in 1999, decentralization was a fact from one day to the other, like a finger snip. So we have a time dimension of 200 years and one day. Um, well, the political dimension says uh, we need the three prerequisites, decentralization, devolution of tasks, and um, what we call the connexity. I haven't found an uh, English expression for this. Connexity means the burden of finances follows the burden of tasks. This is the prerequisite for local governance in Germany as uh, without the money to fulfill the tasks which central and state governments uh, ask us to fulfill at the local level, we cannot fulfill any of these. Uh, so the subsidiarity, the, ta the task being decentralized to the local level has always to be followed by the connexity, as we call it, the money follows the task to the local, to the local level. The, the second dimension, um, is um, the administrative dimension in a way. We need uh, administrative um, bodies at the local level capable of fulfilling these tasks and that means we need also a recruitment and a payment schedule which is comparable to central levels, be it uh, central state or uh, regions or um, central bodies, ministers, uh, administrators, um, they are all by remuneration comparable to the local level. So a mayor in Germany is not that severely uh, worse paid uh, than a minister. And many ministers uh, become mayors and uh, either uh, rather tend to remain mayors as returning to a ministry. Many mayors don't resist to become ministers and it's much more attractive to fulfill tasks and to exert power at the local level than at the central level. And uh, third dimension is, yes, the population. And uh, um, uh, Casey Sivara Markrishnan has said it's the low interest of the people in many communities, which we also face in terms of voting results. Mayors are um, elected by, um, if it works well, 50% of the population. If it works uh, less well, it's 25% even. 
And this is a contradiction um, by the local population. Uh, on the one hand, they have a high interest in uh, uh, seeing their local governments performing well. On the other hand, um, the um, willingness to be part of the local democra uh, democratic processes is not really uh, um, well developed anymore. And this puzzles us a lot as we rely on the local population otherwise we become stakeholder democracies. And a tendency towards this kind of stakeholder democracy is visible in German cities. We look at this very critically and we have to mobilize um, all methodical uh, means to make the majority of the people taking part in public life and taking part in public decisions. Being an uh, elective in a city council is not anymore in Germany a, an honor, it's a burden, and you find not many people who voluntarily enter uh, this task. So these three dimensions make up democracy, and this is why we cannot lean back at all, but have to thrive for strong local democracies day by day. Thank you very much. Um, I just, as we have three more panelists, but there's just something I wanted to ask if there's a quick answer to this. Uh, Hilmar, for you, which is we've heard clearly in the, at least the beginnings of the discussions about Indian cities that the fit is not right. This big question about the fit that came up in our, the, the prior sessions, what is the right fit or the dimensions of the fit between government, governance, and urbanization. So clearly we, we've, we've set the stage that that's not right in Indian cities yet. Gerald has set the stage that's not right in American cities, even where there are in many of the large American cities, strong elected mayors that you're advocating for, it's still not the answer given the, the, the boundaries and the metropolitan nature of urbanization. What's the German story? Do you believe, given you've had, as you said, 200 years and continued experiments, devolution, you have recently section 28 in modern history, have you got the fit right? And if not, where is the fundamental disconnect in the fit in German cities today? Well, in terms of urban development, we tend to talk about robust concepts. And maybe this is also the right term for local democracy. We need robust concepts which persist even under crisis situations uh, and um, resilience uh, in the political sense means also we uh, persist in acting for the people even under crisis situations. I missed the financial point and the fit is always measured along the financial potentials of the cities. And this is probably um, the part where we have a misfit in a way because tasks and financial uh, potentials of the cities do not fit anymore. So I tend rather to get from the political level to the financial level in order to exert the tasks we are uh, we have to exert, we need the, the finances, and this is a misfit between federal and state governments towards the municipalities, as the municipalities aren't by two-thirds not anymore furnished with the financial uh, potentials they ought to have to exert the power. So this is a, a decisive misfit. Um, now that we've taken a pause, I, I, I'd like to just address a question to Gerald who lean back in the chair, and I, I don't know if that's a skeptical look or not, but would you, would you comment on uh, what uh, Hilmar uh, has, has laid out as what seems to be a very scientific and very logical uh, framework, a robust concept, and uh, tell us, is this a model? Is this a model that can be emulated? I, well, I'd like to start by saying I don't believe this is a concept of a model to be replicated. Uh, all these countries, I mean, Casey was talking about the United States, uh, India, I was talking about the United States, the difference is uh, very significant. What I'd like to warn against is uh, there's crept into the discourse a whole variety of words one should be suspicious about, such as stakeholders. Who are stakeholders? Well, they turn out to be corporations and interest groups. In other words, they turn out to be people who are not electors. It turns out to be not about democracy. It turns out to be people involved in the decision making uh, who are not Democrat, uh, uh, elected d d Democrats. The other thing to watch out for is a lot of people want the city to be responsive to the people within it, a very good desire. 
But it doesn't do any good if the city doesn't have the power to do anything. Uh, or it doesn't have the power to do what is necessary. Then the last thing as to what Casey said, it's not surprising that people uh, are not interested in these kinds of issues. No one understands how the government is organized. They think that people can, the mayor can do what they want, even though if the mayor is a, a, a ceremonial figure. Uh, they think the mayor of New York runs the city of New York, but he would be surprised to learn it. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Gerald. Um, I think Gerald's response might actually set the stage very appropriately for our next uh, discussant, Mr. Vijay Kapoor, who uh, had the rather uh, difficult task, I think, of bridging the divide between the sovereign government, the federal government, and a city um, uh, as the l lieutenant governor uh, of Delhi. And Mr. Vijay Kapoor. Thank you. I would, uh, Jagan, like to carry forward a bit the discussion which we started as to how our 74th Amendment was frustrated. Mm. Uh, I would like to bring to your notice that there were two amendments to the Constitution made almost at the same time, the 73rd Amendment and the 74th Amendment. 73rd Amendment related to devolution of government or governance or democracy in the rural areas and the 74th in urban areas. Now the question to be asked is, why were the loopholes left in it? And uh, why was such liberal use of loopholes made uh, fairly soon after the amendment was enacted? For instance, Delhi, by an executive order, was exempted from the operation of the 74th Amendment. Uh, the second question which arises is as to why, after all, the Constitution is only the basic law. Why was this very clear enunciation of the intention to devolve gov governance or devolve democracy to lower levels, why was it not carried through to the other various laws? These are the questions which remain. Let me elaborate as to what I, what I mean. I am doing it in the context of Delhi again. You know, when Delhi was abolished as a part C state and uh, in 1957, we enacted the Delhi Development Act and we enacted the Delhi Municipal Corporation Act. And uh, at that time, there was no Delhi Assembly, there was no Council of Ministers. So all the powers of a government, they vested in the central government. But after Delhi was, be was given a measure of self-governance in the early 90s. Local government, local self-government was a transferred subject. Why were those powers of the central government not transferred to the, to the local government? In fact, the local legislature cannot amend a pre-existing parliamentary law without the approval of the central government. So, it did not happen. The point which I'm making is that the enactment of the two, two amendments to the Constitution was a part of political posturing. And this political posturing, I think uh, an imaginative bureaucracy and uh, uh, could have probably uh, made use of by infusing some substance into it. The substance could have been, by, as I said, by uh, enacting the succeeding legislation and carrying it through the various mechanisms. That did not happen. Uh, of course, uh, as Mr. Varma Krishnan said, the, the problem is uh, the weak uh, demand. And I suspect that uh, weak demand is also because one, of course, is the tendency to be to prefer to be looked after rather than to self-govern. Now that preference, I think, arises from the fact that we want to shy away from raising resources to self-govern. The very weak, uh, very weak will at the local level to raise taxes. Take the state of property tax <coughs> in India. Why should it be so weak? Why should it be non-existent uh, virtually 90% of our urban areas? 
Delhi, I think, raises about a thousand crore by way of property tax. I would submit that um, uh, if property tax were to be strengthened as a as a tax base, that is that probably will act against the local demand for uh, devolution being weak. They strengthen the resource base. So, um, uh, the fact is that the central and the provincial authorities would not let go their authority over the urban areas because those are the happening places. They would not let go that authority. Uh, unless we are able to create um, something on the demand side, uh, we in Delhi, we have tried some, some devices, some little devices to try and create that uh, interest. Uh, for instance, uh, Mrs. Lakey, who represents the New Delhi area and a large part of the Delhi Municipal Corporation in our, in our parliament, is also ex officio member of the New Delhi uh, Municipal Council. And she is also an ex officio member of the Municipal Corporation of Delhi. Now, uh, whether that generates enough interest in her to fight the battles in Parliament uh, for, uh, uh, for local autonomy, I would leave it to her to answer. But that was one. The second point which I want to make very quickly is that we should recognize that Delhi is a metropolitan area. The government of Delhi is metropolitan government. Metropolitan government. It's, it's nothing else. It's, uh, so one has to see whether what is the relevance of various parallel bodies. Do you really need a competing political body in the form of a municipal corporation of Delhi when it's territorially coterminous? And uh, I, I, I think uh, unless some innovative approaches are, are made, we are not going to get out of the stranglehold of uh, the central authorities, either in a federal capital like Delhi or in the cities spread through the provinces of India. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kapoor. Um, I'd like to now invite uh, Wolfgang Schmidt, um, State Secretary, City of Hamburg. Yeah. Yeah, thank, you. thank you very much. Uh, as a German, it's always um, a bit difficult, and I'm a bit um, cautious to talk about Germany or German cities as a role model, as you can understand, hopefully. And um, coming from the city-state of Hamburg, uh, and joining these kinds of discussions, but also meeting colleagues from other cities, I always feel that I'm kind of working in paradise because Hamburg is not only a state, but a city-state. And um, I'm not sure whether this is now the role model for everything, but maybe it can serve as an example what is possible as well for a city. So Hamburg is one of 16 federal states. We have um, three city-states in Germany, Berlin and Bremen and Hamburg. And we take part in the lawmaking process on the national level. So we have an upper house, a senate, that is not composed by elected senators, like in the US, but by members of the governments of the 16 states. And each state has, depending on the side of the state, an amount from three to six votes. So Hamburg, being a city of 1.8 million people, we have three votes, so three members of our government are members of the upper house of the Senate. And the biggest states, they have 18 million inhabitants, so 10 times, they only have six. Every law that passes the German parliament goes to our upper house and we have a saying in that process. And by the constitution, all the laws that have an impact on the financial situation of the states, taxes, or on the administration need the consensus of the upper house. So we have three votes out of 69. The three city-states combined have 10 out of 69. So that gives us kind of a bargaining power 
and helps us to ensure that um, the questions that concern us as cities are taken into consideration. Um, we do not need to back, and so the point that, that Gerald was raising, that like governments are not listening to um, local authorities, actually we don't have this problem, fortunately. Um, now, there are other cities like the ones that Hilma represents that are not that privileged, and they are just cities in uh, the other states. So what we are trying always as city-states, trying to engage them in our debates as well and to take care of our colleagues that are not represented You're in the... the yes, and we are, the, we are a member of the German Association of Cities as well. So maybe I keep it to that. I think obviously it cannot prove as an example for India and now you change the constitution, everything is fine and I welcome you to paradise. But um, it might be a hint to think a little bit bigger and not limit cities only to what we find in our constitutional framework. Okay. Thank you very much. That, that. <laughs> Thanks, Wolfgang. Uh, Wolfgang, that was very responsible. It, it helped us uh, cut our time down. Thank you very much. Um, our last uh, discussant um, is obviously someone who has experienced the demand that's coming from the ground up. Um, for better leadership and uh, possibly a better form of government. And uh, uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to have you speak with us uh, today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I'll be sharing my practical experiences because uh, all the theory we've heard, uh, the practical side of the problem is uh, it's not about confrontation as Mr. Korea was talking about. I think confrontation will bring a city to a still. So we don't definitely want a person who can be confronting all the time and bring city to the still, as we saw previously, asking questions where they are relevant. Now, asking a question for the sake of asking question is not what makes sense. And uh, what happened previously was that uh, today we are faced with a situation where the bureaucracy as Mr. Shivarama Krishna talked about the political will, I'll talk about the bureaucracy, who is completely unresponsive. Being a member, and not just a member, but the presiding officer of New Delhi Municipal Corporation, as Mr. Kapoor just pointed out, and the Municipal Corporation, otherwise South and North, because part of it happens to be in my constituency, I'm a member there also, but New Delhi, I head as a presiding officer. A simple thing like painting the curves yellow and black because it is more visible, luminosity is better, and uh, standards are more. We heard corruption part. Now the entire Delhi, New Delhi area needs to have curves which are made of red sandstone. First, you purchase red sandstone curves, spend 900 crores. Then you paint them pink and green. And here is a presiding officer who wants to change it and make it simpler by painting it yellow and black so that when the fog sets into Delhi, we have visibility on the road so that it's a safety precaution and I can't get it done. How do you feel about it? Is that the way governance system needs to respond? The fact is responsibility and accountability of an elected member is far greater because you represent certain constituency. And people, anybody, rich, poor, poorest, is your responsibility and you're answerable to the well-being of your locality. And in that well-being, while you have the responsibility, you don't have the authority to make the right decision. So it is this authority which one as an elected member seeks. The problem in Delhi is not the federal, state, 73rd amendment, 74th amendment. The problem in Delhi is very, very basic which was started 15 years ago. As Mr. Ramakrishna talked about, one year wonder that a mayor is supposed to be. And we've had uh, we have a city-state like Delhi, which has three mayors. And capacity to generate revenue to run their municipal bodies. Now, eastern 
side of Delhi, Eastern Municipality, is the poorest. Earlier, when it was a joint system, the money will be collected from across the city and it will be equally distributed all around. To gain the political mileage, the previous government divided the city into three municipal bodies because she thought she'll probably be in a position to control one municipal body, if not two. Now, best part is that Delhi has three municipal corporation in addition to New Delhi Municipal Corporation. And obviously, each municipal corporation is not in a position to generate the required resources. And who should control the city? The city has to be controlled by people who fund it. If the funding is going to come from the center, then center better control it. Because if there is a gap between the two, enough of you know, charade of local self-governance, etc. Local bodies are required to make the decision, have to be part of decision making. Whether it is the first tier, it's the second tier, it's the third tier, all tiers need to work in synchronization with the other. And obviously, if a foot over bridge is needed, it is needed, and no one person gets to decide whether it can be made at this spot or that spot. It has to be scientifically determined, and that scientific determination will determine where the bridge is going to be. Yeah. And, and, and it is here that you need a firm person to head that decision making, apart from the fact that the consensus must support the requirement of local populace. And until and unless local populace is satisfied about the decision making, it just can't go on. And under these circumstances, 5,000 plus cities existed in Delhi, in India, by 2001. And today, it is heading towards 8,000, 100 smart cities. 390 billion is the requirement to rebuild Delhi the way we want to. And that money, 40% or so, 44% is going to be spent on the roads, some 14% on traffic, close to 14 to 16% on drainage, rest administrative costs, and housing has not been determined. So I guess when you look at the uh, task, the task is pretty large, which cannot be met by the municipal bodies themselves. And being in the peculiar state's capital, we need to have, uh, we, we can't just do away with the central control. At the same time, the cohesion and cohesive approach is what is required at all tiers. And a person like me is faced with 60 years of since when lands are taken away from the villagers at 10 rupees an acre in 1967. And, and 300 or 400 of those people have still not received their compensation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, um, I think we should take a quick possibility of the discussants uh, wanting to respond. Um, I, I, I think certainly uh, Mrs. Lakey has, has pointed out something which is very compelling. If, if the money is coming from a particular source, that source must have control. Um, does, that, does that agree with uh, what Gerald might say? So is this working? So if you organize localities so they get financed by their own resources. Poor localities without resources will go under. If you organize finances by having more centralized government allocate money across lines, central government will have the authority. Neither one is working very well. So we are, one way or the other, we are undermining some form of local power, either local finance or central finance. That's why we have a structural problem. We have a structural problem about organizing finance, uh, not choosing between these two uh, models. Uh, both need to work in cohesion with each other. That's exactly what I'm trying to say. Uh, the local requirement has to be supplied by the local side, and the governance or the finance for that particular project can come from the center and thus how the money will be spent can be controlled in that format because it is not one versus the other, it is all together. And, and when all together work in a certain format, it leads to better governance. Okay. Um, uh, Charles, would, would, would you like to jump in here? You spoke about hope. Uh, are we losing this, this, this idea in, in talking about money and political power? 
You know, yeah, of course, I think cities have, have got these three great qualities of the skills, the economic engines. I mean, the whole of the Chinese, South China um, miracle was fueled by Hong Kong. You know that. Bombay could do the same if we managed our cities correctly. But really what I would like to emphasize was this business of proactive government. We are still talking as though we're sitting in, a, in, in countries which are totally urbanized. There's no urgency to the problems in New York of in the kind we have here because you're already 80% urban. We are on our way there. If we don't act decisively and, and how to say, anticipating swiftly, the whole mindset of government has to change and then the problem changes. Now I wish the urban age could bring that sense of urgency into management. It's not just accountability, it's urgency. Like you do really seriously, like you do with Ebola. You must understand what is going on in this country. Okay. So there is, there is, a, there is a crisis that, that needs to be sorted out. KCS, That's could we it. ask you to uh, respond to that? Let's open I think, it up. Uh, the crisis that Charles points out is very real. It's the crisis of jobs. It's the crisis of growing urban population. It's the crisis of migration. It's the crisis of crumbling infrastructure. I think when he used the word confrontation, what he really meant was that these are different issues represented by different entities will have to brought together. The situation does not permit one single arbiter, whether it is the central government or whether it is the provincial government. Robert Norman, the political scientist years ago, mentioned this as a sovereignty trap. Even the most powerful country is not agile to deal with the problems of a city. Even the most prosperous city cannot hope to have a governing voice as far as the country is concerned. It needs people to come together. It needs institutions to come together. I agree with Vijay Kapoor that having started the 74th Amendment, the various measures at the state level should have been taken and that unfortunately did not, and therefore you come to the disturbing conclusion, is the amendment a policy or is it a posture? And I think that's, that's an important question. To my mind it seems, how much more severe should the present crisis get? And I'm afraid if a knowledge city like Bangalore, which is world known, cannot bring its act together and see a solution only in gated communities and industrial areas. What is all this knowledge in honor of? If we cannot come together and if we cannot rec reconcile, what sort of a government are we? And I'm happy that, uh, you know, a member of parliament, you know, is conscious of this. I'm afraid there is no escape from a constant discussion and discourse to bring about some kind of a system. Ultimately, all big cities are intergovernmental. They are not unigovernmental. Okay, Th thank you very much. We have to go into questions right now. So if the two discussants who do have a point, perhaps we, we might be able to address it through an answer to a question. Um, can I now invite the audience to raise their arms if they have a question? Um, let me just look around the room. Okay, so we, we have three questions. Uh, yes. So, uh, can I, can I, can I in fact address the first question from uh, Mrs. Meera Shankar? Yes? Um, I'm Meera Shankar. Hello. Sorry. And could you please make your question really brief? Yeah. And well, yeah. it's um, not strictly a question, but I'll pose it to them because you're talking about how the whole question of revitalizing our institutions of municipal governance could be done. 
what would you say to having like the you know finance commission which apportions revenue on certain principles between the center and the state to have a similar thing where you evolve certain norms for apportioning of revenue between the state and the municipal bodies so that the question of financing in some sense gets addressed okay we'll take the other two questions as well and then we'll uh, ask the discussions to answer yes um, yes please and then we we have a question here the third one is here okay uh, thank you mr chair my question is to madam uh, lakey uh, ms lakey you're from the bjp a party that's uh, very close to the hearts of uh, urban dwellers so i'm um, asking you a question at the national level i want to take you away from delhi is the bjp uh, over the next 5 hopefully 10 years really going to empower uh, metropolitan areas into metropolitan states uh, in the context of the discussion we just had that's about the only way that there is to uh, fit uh, finance form and function into one cohesive whole in india we have, we have the third question from here um, could we have a mic here please I think the gentleman here uh, raised his arm earlier. Could you could you please? Yeah. Yeah. Question is for Mrs. Lakey. Today is Children's Day, and also our former First Prime Minister's anniversary. And the third one is a quotation from our Father of Nation, which said that good health is more important than wealth and given the situation today in delhi the air quality in delhi is unhealthy or unacceptable uh, in terms of questions of what do people want i think there is no awareness in the people as to what the air quality is um, what does it Mr. mean Mitchell, for them and Mr. the Mitchell, children and me. The children uh, are unsafe. Could we limit it to a question, please? We, we do so have the question is, time. what can we together do to solve this? It's not okay. a negative, but the question is, how do we overcome this? So uh, we'd like to address uh, the questions first, and, and two of the questions are for Mrs. Lakey, and perhaps she could start, and then I'd like Wolfgang to actually uh, dwell on the question from uh, Mrs. Meera Shankar, please. Uh, to begin with, the question that whether metropolitan uh, cities are going to be metropolitan states, uh, the answer is uh, que sera sera, whatever will be, will be, because I can't uh, decide for future what the decision is going to be. And I am definitely not working on the premise that all cities need to be given the status of a state. At the same time, cities need to have uh, governance, and governance would mean uh, uh, local governance in terms of waste management, electricity, water supplies, drainage, education, skill training, all that I'm very keen to work on, and that is what I assure you today. But whether the status is going to change to something else in terms of the governmental structure, I can make no comments. The other one coming to me is about the air pollution quality, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There are two things. Uh, one is that uh, air pollution is far severe in many other parts of the world. The Delhi has a peculiar climate, especially this time around. And with uh, high moisture and other things, the suspended particles tend to settle down close to the bottom of the earth. And that is why you tend to get higher percentages. So I think awareness of all kinds and scientific awareness is what, the way, what is the way forward, not just the propaganda. As uh, I think Mr. Gerald talked about, that there are caucuses of all kind which spread all kind of news so I think best is to be aware of what's going on. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Wolfgang. Yeah, thank you. Obviously, I think um, cities need and the municipalities need the, the funding to fulfill the services. In Germany, again, we have this fortunate constitution um, that um, distributes, for example, the income tax, 42.5% goes to the federal level, 42.5% goes to the states, and 15 goes to the municipalities. 
Hamburg collects annually like 30 billion euro and we keep only nine. The rest is distributed to the state level and to other states and cities. So I think, uh, yes, we need, and Hilma was talking about that, the constant fight of sufficient funding. But I think as the discussion evolved a little bit in this direction that we discussed finances and also um, our relation to the central government or the state government, I think we shouldn't forget also the inner city constitution and how we deal as city governments with the districts. Because this, I think, is especially in, in bigger cities, in mega cities, a crucial question. How, how much can you really control as a central city government the waste management, the urban planning, and so on and so on, and how much coherency you need within the city. And I think this is one of the crucial topics that we should okay. also talk about maybe over break. All right, thank you very much. Um, we, have, yeah, we have one question there and two questions here. Is that correct? Could we start with that? Or, okay, or one, one there and then there. Yeah. yeah. Let, okay. Let's start here. So she's, she's Was she the first? <coughs> okay. go, go, go. Thank you. Hello, hello. Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. This is Vijay Kumar from Katputli Colony. And on this issue, I just wanted to ask that why public? Why not, uh, why private? Why not public peoples uh, in the whole issue? Like now, I'm in Katputli Colony, and now we are facing a great rehabilitation issue. And I just heard about the PPP project. So I just wanted to ask that in the whole project, why public participation is not there? And how can we more and more participate in this whole project? Like place and that this all uh, housing uh, schemes will be designed according to the people's livelihood. So I think okay. how we can uh, participate in the whole issue. Okay. Like we are the people living in this area in the uh, urban I'll, and we are talking about the urban age here. I'll, so I'll explain also the, the problem of the Katputli colony as well uh, for, for the audience. Yeah, so that's just, okay. I just Thank wanted you. to ask Thank our participation Thanks. in the project. Thank you, um, I think this is a very interesting question. Just a very quick background to this to, for, for especially our guests from outside India. Uh, Katputli colony is actually, Katputli means uh, puppetry, puppeteers, puppet, puppetry. And this is a colony of um, um, uh, people from the state of Rajasthan who uh, moved and have uh, over many decades established a large settlement in Delhi. And this is the site of one of the big experiments with public-private partnership for upgradation of slums so to speak, and Bombay is another one where this experiment is being tried out. So the context for that question is uh, the public participation in that, and it's very interesting that he's asking about participation in a PPP project. Um, yes, thank you. I'm we'll Barbara take two more questions Ishinger. and then we'll answer. I'm Barbara Ishinger, and um, I uh, was very interested in all the different levels of challenges which we have described regarding decision making, especially Gerald Fur. And I would like to add another layer. Uh, for instance, in education. If you introduce new reforms, new curricula, uh, new forms of schools, like comprehensive schools, or tuition fees, this is all party run. And it's ideological. How can we achieve any sustainability there? You introduce a reform, a new curriculum. Here comes one month later, or maybe one year later, uh, a new minister, and everything is upside down again. That's my question. OK, thank you. And one more question, I think, over here. Or, yes? Uh, hi, my name is Shreya from the Institute for Transportation and Development Policy. Sure. Uh, I, like, take the example of Bombay, Mumbai, where the Municipal Corporation, MCGM, as well as MMRDA, are pretty much flush with money. They have more money than many states. And yet, in spite of the fact that the city has money, the right things aren't happening. So is money the only question? And is money in the city's hands the question? Or is, is it? primarily a question of intentionality of what the right things are and how they can be done. Okay. 
Okay, I, ne I need volunteers here. Um, otherwise, I'll end up directing both questions to uh, Mrs. Lakey, but perhaps you could answer the last one first, and then we could address the other two. Uh, See, that, that is not directly related to my constituency, but Katputli is okay. related to my constituency. Oh, okay, please. And, uh, uh, but uh, giving an overview, uh, see, if wrongs have been set into education system and wrong curriculum is what is being taught, every government has every right to correct that curriculum. And I think once the fact is that they are representing a public view on certain issues, they have a right to decide what the curriculum should be. The second, and continuity of course has to be maintained. The second part that there are municipal bodies which have uh, the right amount of funding and yet bad decision making. So quite clearly, the local participation on issues and people who are heading those authorities are bereft of the ground reality and are not answerable to the public directly. For example, in case of NDMC, it is the chairman who gets to decide what it is going to be, but the responsibility remains of the member of parliament. So that needs to be corrected. Coming to the third part, uh, the Katputli colony, I was the one to rake it up in my uh, elections. And uh, I know these, I know the lady here, I've, I've worked with these people. The problem has been that they have signed various documents earlier and a lot of people have been fooling around and few things have happened in the court where certain consents have been given without understanding the uh, repercussion. The fact is that why PPP model? PPP model is not what is to be blamed. What is to be blamed is the corruption. PPP is a good model as long as you get uh, uh, private people to participate in equity because government does not have that kind of equity. But participation of public as to what their requirement has been, I have been fighting for them because uh, puppeteers definitely need space to work on because half their homes are working as workshops also. So any new plan needs to have uh, uh, to introduce that kind of setup. But the problem which uh, I think Mr. Gerald again talked about was corruption. That a piece of land has been s given to uh, a private uh, builder uh, less, uh, at uh, less than the government price. Uh, for example, if it is two lakh rupees uh, an acre or two lakh rupees per square meter, it's been given at a few thousand rupees. And the entire project of 64 acres has been given for nine crores or seven odd crores. Okay, so uh, I'm just going to ask Gerald to, to jump in here with uh, addressing this whole issue of PPP because this is part of the national debate right now and PPP really uh, is either a pinch point in this connection between the central uh, state and, and local um, or could be an opportunity. What, what's your opinion? Uh, uh, Public-private partnerships can be helpful depending on what the deal is. And we need to very much understand what the deal is. And we also need to understand who is representing the public and who is the private. In other words, it's not an abstraction. It's some concrete thing. While I have the floor, two more sentences. One about air pollution. There's a lot that a city could do about air pollution if it had the authority. We need to try to figure out why it has not been given the authority to deal with air pollution. And there's a lot the city could do about education too. Uh, and when you talk about the minister uh, intervening, we're talking about the structure of the organization of the education system and who has the authority. One, maybe one sentence. I'm worried about waiting for the demand of the people to change the structure. The people are likely to be interested in concrete issues. Education, sanitation, water, electricity, traffic, uh, health, many other issues. The issue of structure is not going to be a, a demand. This has to be done at, at the level of, uh, of government. Do we have time for a response here? I think we have to. Okay. One I, think we, I think, unfortunately, we are over time, and uh, we could continue this debate. I, yeah. I'll just do a very, I'm not even going to try to sum up a very interesting conversation, but I think it leaves with a couple of very quick points. In the first session, Richard Sennett quoting Erickson said that growth is managing complexity that you don't simplify. And one of the things, Gerald, in your talk that you said is there is no one model, people searching for a model. There isn't one model. 
Uh, and I think we're really struggling with this question of, of what is the fit? How do we fit between the issues that we're confronted with, with ge geographical boundaries, with administrative boundaries, and trying to figure out how to sort these through? It's not, as you say, bottom up or top down. We've heard different ways to try to get the right, uh, the right fit. Uh, between form, function, and governance. And I guess just a couple of very quick things that have come out of this discussion. Um, one is uh, that clearly right now with the, the pace, which was something that was raised this morning, the speed of urbanization, uh, Charles, what you talked about, KC, which is the recognition that the, the urbanization of India, the urgency of that that it presents, um, has to um, generate somewhere a dialogue and a discussion about what is the proper form and what is the proper fit in terms of the way uh, society and, and cities are changing. Where that occurs, I think we've still left as an open question. You've called for a national commission. You've called for uh, different ways of doing this. Gerald's, I think, admonition, don't wait for the demand of the people. As Casey pointed out, there's not the demand that's come up. We shouldn't wait for that. But that doesn't mean that this debate shouldn't happen. I think you had a very cautionary tale. Will the state ever actually give up control and cede control? That's a very, very uh, important question. So I don't think we've answered these things, but I think what we have raised, continuing on the themes of this morning, is trying to sort out that we're not looking today for one model. We are looking at how to create this tension and confrontation that brings these issues to the table and begins to really recognize how urbanization is going to force very different changes. And as uh, our member of parliament says, this disconnect between responsibility and authority and how does that get addressed in a way that really serves uh, local democracy and the basic provision of services with the challenges people are, are, um, are meeting? I think all of these are continue to be on the table.